How does hydroxyurea in general compare to L-glutamine? Yeah, so L-glutamine is a is a new sort of a new player in in the in the realm of sickle cell disease, and um, it's also a preventative medication that. Uh, it has shown in, in the phase three trial that it reduces vasoocclusive episodes by about 25%. Um, so it's a medication that's sort of now just starting to make its way into clinics around America. And we are um, still sort of toying with the idea of how exactly to implement it in our clinics, who should be getting it, how we should be um, uh, recommending it and, and what criteria we should use. Um, we've had some trouble with um, insurance companies as far as um, getting the, the medication paid for, um, which has been a little bit of a barrier to us being able to, to use it properly. So let me ask a couple questions and I don't want to bring the payers into it. So do you have a set age that you're looking for for these patients? So in general, we uh, the phase three data is for patients who are five and older. Um, so we are um, sort of starting there and really at this point, at least in my clinic, we're using it in patients who are on hydroxyurea and still having issues. Okay. And the, the last question about it is, you mentioned uh, having long discussions with your patients about the potential adverse events of uh, HU. How does this compare to that? So fortunately, um, L-glutamine has a um, very limited um, sort of toxicity profile and a very limited adverse event uh, list. Um, patients so far anecdotally seem to be doing quite well on it. And from the phase three data, it seems like beyond minimal abdo abdominal discomfort, there really isn't, isn't too much to work. So I want to pull uh, you in first on, and, and ask you about, um, you, you would earlier mentioned some, some issues around the cost of these things and, and the use of these medications, but also concerns about compliance and so on. So yeah. could you speak about the two products that we just have been going over in your experience uh, with those? Well, I think our, our stance is that it's an individualized approach to this, tr to this disease for the patient. Not everyone <laughs> is gonna uh, respond well to hydroxyurea. We don't par off any of these drugs for our patients. Um, the surprising thing is, is we and we certainly understand the value hydroxyurea has and its place in therapy, but in our pediatric, or our population that's 21 years or younger, there's only about 15% 15 15 of those patients that had an actual paid claim for hydroxyurea. And then only half of those remained adherent. And so, uh, and again, in a rural state like North Carolina, it could be because of the monitoring, because that could be another two hour trip to a center of excellence or a physician's office to get that monitoring or that lab work drawn. Uh, and then it even decreases further as the patient ages. The adult population, only about 5% of those patients had a, a paid claim for hydroxyurea and 2% were adherent. So, you know, so uh, we recognize the challenge could be the laboratory monitoring. We don't know also a lot of times, I, I think there is a lack of care management for these patients because a lot of times the physician, the pharmacy knows the refill history the physician may not know that they're not getting their hydroxyurea filled. And we certainly pay attention to other disease states and how important it is to be adherent, but we don't put enough emphasis or measures around trying to in ensure adherence for, the, for those patients. I, I would love to get to that 90% adherence that you <laughs> quoted uh, in an underdeveloped country because that is so telling in terms of, as John stated, the, um, the underutilization of a very old drug that's low cost and has very significant implications for uh, symptoms and, how, and potentially even survival. Um, I do think, you know, as we think about the barriers or the access issues around the laboratory monitoring and what does comprehensive care look like, yeah. perhaps we could facilitate the monitoring, whether it's you know through services that can come into the home to draw the labs, or uh, through case management, facilitate issues around psychosocial or transportation. But I think again, to me, this is such low-hanging fruit in terms of the opportunity to maximize the treatment. And in a center of excellence like yours, what is that adherence? Because I think as payers, we see 
low double digits, 12, 15 percent. Yeah, use of hydroxyurea. In North Carolina. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's The adherence is low. Yeah, so. un unfortunately, I would say even, even at a center like ours, which is one of the largest in the country, um, our adherence with hydroxyurea is probably in the range of 15 to 25 percent, mm -hmm. um, which is quite unfortunate.